Okay, uh, got a lot of people today for this workshop. And I just want to welcome everybody to the AG2PI SNP workshop. Um, this will be led by Dr. Jacob Landis. He is at Cornell University, uh, where he does this sort of research uh, pretty regularly with populations of agricultural crops. Um, and I just wanted to remind everybody that this is the first workshop in a, in a two part. Um, so this is working on the single nucleotide polymorphism data or SNP data. Uh, and, then the, and then on June 24th, at the same time of day, we will have a, a workshop run by a, a researcher at Iowa State um, doing genome-wide association studies. So this is like the first step moving towards doing the genome-wide association studies. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Jacob. Let me get everything set up here. No company name. All right, so. Uh, Thank you all for joining us this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are. Um, so we're going to talk about an introduction to SNP data analysis. I see the next uh, you know, two hours or so being in at least three parts. The first is I have this presentation to go over, uh, some of the background information, some of what we are going to uh, be doing. And then uh, we'll have a tutorial on uh, using the discovery environment with Cyverse to actually run through the different analyses. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. Um, I do have uh, a second monitor set up with the chat window open. So if at any point you have questions uh, that you want me to clarify, uh, especially for this first part, please ask and I will uh, address those um, when I can. And we also have uh, all the slides are available on GitHub. I'm going to repost the link in here so everybody has it. So on this GitHub repository in the chat, the slides are there as well as the tutorial um, for the SNP analysis that we'll do a little bit later on. All right. So for uh, the outline of at least this first part for the talk, there's a few uh, key things we'll go through. Um, so we're gonna talk about what are SNPs and why do we want to call them? Uh, then go into what we can do with these, uh, these SNPs, what we call them. And then the last two pieces will be more of the actually the hands-on applications. So uh, some approaches to calling SNPs, mainly in the discovery environment of Cyverse, but also I have it set up with the actual commands that you would use uh, if you are doing this on your own uh, server, cluster, computer system, what have you, they, they, they do integrate. And then the last part is a little bit of some downstream applications with Koji, uh, where we can input our or import our SNP uh, BCF file and to look at um, the actual SNPs we call. And so we'll do, we'll go into that at the end as well. So before we get into the actual analyses, what is a SNP? So at the simplest, a SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. You can see here an example of three strings of DNA on the right, where they match up, they're almost exactly the same, except for this blue bar where in the first string we have an A, we have a G in the middle and a T at the bottom. And so why is it important to have these? Why is it important to call SNPs? So SNPs are the most common genetic variation. They can be linked to phenotype, environment, heredity, what have you. We can actually do a lot of uh, comparisons between what we observe and the gen uh, genotypes underneath those. And the basic workflow for, for calling SNPs or finding these variants is you have your sequencing data in FASTQ format, you align or assemble these. Uh, if you have the reference genome, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, You'll find the variants, find where they're different, and then we'll filter these out so that you have high quality step or high quality SNPs. And then you can move into the downstream applications such as GWAS or other things, which we'll touch just uh, briefly on 
at least to, to show those examples. We will not go into the details of how to do those today. So when I think of SNPs myself, I think of several of these different uh, analyses, the genome-wide association to look for a SNP that's associated with a particular phenotype or uh, environment. Uh, I have a phylogenetics background originally, so I think of relationships, um, either in coalescent trees or other network analyses to say which individuals, which populations are more similar to each other, maybe where do they originate, where have they uh, uh, evolved to or where have they moved to. And then we can also look at structure, admixture, or principal component to say how are different individuals and different populations related, how might uh, gene flow uh, be characterized or um, or uh, evident in these populations as well. And so these are things that I think most people think about when they think of SNPs, but you know that's always the goal of where to get, but it takes a lot of work to get there. And a lot of what we're talking about today, um, both talking about and a little bit hands-on, will get us to the point where you can actually start to address some of these uh, questions, some of these goals uh, downstream. So talking about, um, Again, what can you address with, with using this data set? Uh, you know, so you can look at evolution, evolutionary relationships. Uh, you can look at how populations are related, how individuals and populations, how species are related. You can do all this uh, with SNP data. But sometimes you, know, you run into the question of, is, it, is SNPs the best option or using orthologous genes? And I think it really depends on the question that you have, the scope you have, uh, the, 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 set of, the, the, the setup, the system that you're working with. Uh, you know, if you're looking at uh, individuals and different, and different families or orders of plants, using SNPs are probably not gonna be the best uh, approach forward. If you have several populations though, and you wanna know how these are related, how are individuals in those populations related? SNPs are the, very, are the best way to do that. And so some of the hesitation with SNPs and some data sets or some scales is that these very fast changing nucleotides, um, which are SNPs or, or, or those may hide the true signal in deeper relationships. And part of that is this you know, uh, third position wobble that we all learned about in kind of intro bio, where you may have uh, that third base pair position changing, but the protein doesn't change. And so we can definitely pick those up, but those are not going to have much of an impact usually on phenotypes or other things that we may see. Again, trying to address the question of SNPs versus orthologous genes, uh, another question is going to be based on your, your specific study, what is the sequencing coverage that you need to be confident in what you are calling, either a gene or a SNP? So for orthologous genes to assemble these and say hide uh, capture, hide seek uh, data sets, you may need 20 to 50x sequencing coverage for that. For SNP data, uh, if your species is mostly homozygous, uh, maybe 6x coverage is enough to be confident in what the genotype is. For outcrossing species that are very uh, heterozygous, 15x coverage is probably a minimum that you want. And so it's a trade-off between, again, total coverage, size of the genome, number of individuals you have to which approach really works best. And then there's an, uh, the argument of, for some of these analyses, do you include uh, invariant sites or not? If you're looking at evolutionary trees, phylogenetics, uh, your branch links may be biased a little bit if you only have variant sites versus not. And so these are some of the things that you consider. Unfortunately, I don't have a, you know, kind of a, uh, a magic word saying, it's, you know, in this scenario, it's always going to be this. It's really going to be kind of study um, uh, dependent, um, but we'll lay out some of the different uh, things that you can do uh, to try to address the questions that you have. So we talk about evolutionary relationships. You can also look at gene flow. Uh, so you can, using structure, admixture, or similar types of analyses, you can estimate the uh, number of ancestral populations in your system. Uh, so not the current number of, of populations you see, but what may have, um, what is the statistically the best uh, inference to um, 
kind of, again, the more ancestral type. And you can also see where different individuals uh, in current populations maybe don't hold up genetically quite the same. And so a lot of these structure admixture plots, you can see where uh, the different colors represent uh, the ancestral populations, but you can see that some individuals have a mixture of, of different colors. And so that is a good, there's some evidence there that you have gene flow uh, in your system. And uh, you can also um, test for uh, how similar or genetically similar uh, organisms are that are geographically close to each other. So isolation by distance, is it just the fact that they're more spread out where gene flow is potentially reduced uh, that you have these differences? Can I ask a question? Are you using, yes. what program are you using for this? this this looks like a structure to me. Uh, so, yes, this is, yeah. So this, this plot down here is a structure plot generated in the LEA package of R. Okay. And so uh, I've got uh, some slides that towards the end uh, that point to some resources uh, to help you start doing some of these analyses later on, but that's not necessarily the goal of today. The goal made for today is to get to the point where we have our SNPs that we could actually get to uh, to making some of these plots. Will you go into a different training for that part? Uh, so that's not uh, for today. There is the next no, month. not this time, but in another meeting. I don't there, there is there there will be other opportunities to to address that uh, in in different workshops and whatnot. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm just checking out the chat real quick. Uh, yes, I wasn't trying to dismiss the third base completely. Uh, in some cases, that might be uh, where, I mean, it could be useful and you may need it. I was just saying that for some, for some questions, because of how frequently some of these things do change, certain analyses are not always the best uh, for everything. All right, so we have gene flow here. And then again, this is kind of setting up for next month genome wide association. So again, you can look for particular markers or these SNPs in this case to look for associations with phenotypes of interest, uh, say, you know, in, in the plant realm, plant height, days of flowering, uh, number of flowers, number of leaves, or, or whatnot. Um, Again, this kind of goes into more, uh, it's more complex, but there's also the considerations that you need to have, such as normalizing phenotype data, uh, quantitative, you do need a quantitative continuous data, uh, and then make sure that your sample size is large enough, both in terms of individual sampling, number of SNPs, number of how you define a trait and so forth. Um, but these will be covered much more later on. But most of these methods for genome-wide association are designed for data sets with a reference genome. So that often means you have the low number of contigs, uh, which may be in chromosome scale, maybe not. Um, when we do a de novo approach for colony SNPs, which is totally fine for some analyses, uh, we run into issues with linkage disequilibrium and the lack of coverage across the genome and the number of, of contigs. And so again, depending on what your specific system is, your, uh, your species, your population, uh, there's some, there are many considerations uh, before we can do some of these analyses. But again, for the focus of today of actually generating the SNPs, uh, there's several different ways to do this. Um, if you're focused on more of a phylogenomics approach, uh, there are ways to generate the data. We'll talk a little bit more about these in the coming slides. And these include genome skimming, genome resequencing, uh, RADseq methods, RNA-seq or uh, HypeSeq or these cap, uh, probe capture sets. All of these have different pieces that uh, need to be uh, taken into consideration. Do you have a genomic resource uh, available? Do you have a sequenced genome? What's the quality of that genome? How much bioinformatic investment do you have, either initial or downstream? What's the cost per sample? How many samples do you want? How big is the genome of your, 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 your species of interest? 
all these things will go in, will factor into what approach you decide to take to generate the SNPs. And uh, so I think uh, there's uh, a bit more on, on the text here to elaborate that, but we'll go through some of these different options and compare the pros and cons to some of these coming up. So the first one is RADSeq. Uh, so this is a reduced representation of the genome. And so you are not sequencing the entire genome. The, the markers are often genome wide, um, but you have a higher coverage in the sequenced libraries or the sequ uh, sequence uh, loci. You can do uh, many, many individual things. Again, because you're not doing the entire genome, you can add in a lot more individuals and other methods, uh, especially this is true if you have uh, species with large genomes, uh, say, you know, five gigs, a five gigabase genome or more, this might be a, a feasible approach. For uh, the entire uh, wet lab sequencing uh, setup, depending on how you do it, uh, this is a cheaper option than some of the other ones. Possibly the cost could get down to around $15 per sample uh, in total, especially if you're doing a lot of the prep work yourself. And you do not necessarily need a reference genome for, the, for RADC, but it does help. Now the cons to this, maybe why you wouldn't want to do this, uh, you do not get the whole genome. Uh, so you are often missing many things. Some of these may be uh, important for the traits that you're interested in. It can be also very hard to integrate data sets, uh, even in the same species across different studies, unless they use the same enzymes, especially if you mix the enzymes of where the cut sites are, they don't really compare. And so it's hard to integrate maybe previous data to new data. And then also there is a bias between species and or degraded samples, say if you're using herbarium vouchers or museum collected samples, if there's a mutation in the enzyme cut site, that loci, that locus is going to be gone. You will not have any data for that, even though maybe those flanking regions of that cut site are in fact uh, still there. And again, with RADC, you know, there's many different flavors of this. Here's just a quick comparison from a paper a few years ago looking at the original RAD, uh, 2B RAD, GBS, DD RAD, all of these different things uh, have different uh, considerations such as the enzymes, the amount of cost, the kits that you need, uh, the de novo versus reference guided. So I'm not gonna go through all the details here. But again, this slide is available on, on the, in the PDF slides, it's on GitHub. So you can kind of go through this a bit more to see if it's appropriate for you. Now I'm gonna group the next two, RNA-seq versus, and, and HYBE-seq kind of together. Uh, there are some potential benefits from these different ones if you wanted to do them. Uh, so, you know, RNA-seq, you only get the genes that are expressed in a particular tissue at a particular time. You have lots of coverage for the sequence loci, but again, if it's a, if it's a gene that's not expressed at a given yeah, time or location, uh, you're not going to have that. I wouldn't make any and then uh, the phenotypic differences that we, that we see may not be linked to the sequence of the coding region, but in the promoter region, and you're likely we, we, you could miss this uh, with this data set, whereas some of the other ones, you, you, could, you, you would actually have this data. For the hype seek approach, uh, so this is where you need to have a probe set uh, to, to pull down uh, particular uh, regions of the genome that match to your probes which is shown here on the right. Uh, so these probe sets can be expensive. And again, you need to have a reference, uh, reference sequences, either genome, transcriptome, some kind of reference to build the probe set, uh, if it's, especially if it's a lineage specific probe set to find those regions. Now there are some ultra conserved elements and other things that you can use. But again, for these, you are not getting the entire genome. And so the last option here is genome resequencing. This uh, for a lot of systems is the preferred method, especially in more recent studies, but it's not always possible. So it does cover the entire genome. Uh, so you don't have the, maybe the bias that you see with, 
with uh, RNA seq or rad seq. You can use silica dried or old tissue um, for a lot of these things. That works fine. You don't always have the same biases in terms of cut sites that you see with rad seq, especially because most of the data processing and sequencing is going to be voluminous. It's going to be shared anyway. And you do not need to have any special library prep, such as enzymes or probes. However, some of the drawbacks to this approach is that you do need to have a reference genome or something similar to align these reads to. You need to make sure that you know where uh, the stretch of, of the sequence that you have, what it is, how it compares to other individuals. And for large genome species, it's the cost is not really feasible if you're thinking about doing hundreds of samples. Uh, one benchmark that people often will say is around one, uh, one gigabase genome. Anything less than that is definitely good for many individuals for resequencing. Above that, it becomes a trade-off between what you can afford, uh, the sequencing depth, and the number of individuals. So this was just a little bit of a background about kind of how to generate some of this data. And so moving on to from data generation to data analysis, at least for today, we're going to be using the discovery environment, uh, which is part of Cybers in the Cybers uh, universe. And so this is a point and click option. You do not need or does not require a knowledge of command line, though for the tutorial or for the slides actually we're presenting now, I will have the specific command lines that that are the equivalent of that if you wanted to do that on your own machine or, or system. This uh, discovery environment, it works great for small data sets, but for larger projects in terms of number of species, number of samples, number of accessions, uh, you'll likely need more resources than are the default for that. But this will definitely give you a good start. And then one other thing to consider is that for a lot of these apps, we've already built them for these analyses, um, but you do not always have full functionality of all the options. Uh, so the command line often works a bit better for that. Uh, I'm looking at the chat real quick. There's a question about low coverage. And so what do I consider low coverage? Well, it kind of depends on the system that you are working with. Uh, so I study plants and I would say that a lot of the, uh, for high quality SNPs, especially for outcrossing uh, individuals, what I've seen recommended is around 15 X coverage uh, for uh, the sites. So that way you know what is a homozygous, what is heterozygous, how those uh, differ. If you're talking about polypoidy things, those numbers go up. And so I think, you know, comfortably let anything less than 10 X is low coverage, but I would be more comfortable higher up 15 to 20 X coverage as a target uh, to be confident in what you are calling. All right, so the next bit of the slides, we're going to go into more of uh, the commands and how we would do the analyses. I am going to talk a little bit about kind of the RAD, still talking about the RAD seek approach at first um, and the commands uh, that you would do in the command line environment, but then we'll move into uh, more of the discovery environment, specifically calling SNPs with GATK. And then we'll, we'll see the, the, the specific commands on the slides, but then in the, in the tutorial, we'll have the apps that we'll use for those. So again, going back to RADSEQ, just, just uh, a little bit before we move into kind of the bulk of what we're talking about today. Uh, with the RADSEQ approach, there is a de novo option. So if you do not have a reference genome, you can still do many of these analyses to look, uh, look at population genetics, um, to see you know, what's migration, how things are related. These are fairly straightforward. Uh, uh, approaches for the DNA itself, either a basic CTAB or a similar type of extraction, SDS, kind of your basic uh, approach works really well. There are a lot of options out there for, uh, in terms of enzymes, 
uh, different cut sites, the frequency that they do. Um, some of the, a lot of the more commercial uh, uh, sequencing cores that you could pay to do this, they have a certain set that they use. Again, for silica drab material, it works great, can work well for herbarium samples in some cases, though degraded samples often uh, have trouble. If you look at the, the spots from um, a 2015 paper, you see that the, the longer it was since collection, the quality, the number of quality reads goes down and the amount of missingness in terms of low side mist goes up. And so things that are relatively fresh, relatively new, newly sampled, works great for the most part, 30, 40, 50 years out, you start, you do start missing and dropping uh, signal. There are several options in terms of the de novo approach. Uh, the two most common I see often are IPIRAD or STACS, um, but there are other things that could be done as well. At least for STACS, which is one I have used the most, uh, with the de novo uh, approach, so again, no reference genome, there's a, a Perl script wrapper that will run through the entire process for you. So you just specify it, the, um, the FASTQ files, and it will go through the steps of figuring out where they overlap and cause and, and uh, call SNPs. And this is from the, the user manual. So it assembles loci uh, in each individuals, allowing for uh, potentially a range of mismatches, which you can specify. And then it, see, then it builds this catalog to see where they overlap, which ones are kind of the same locus, and then matches these for SNP calling. So again, if you're doing this on your own, so we do not have a uh, discovery environment app for this at the time for this time. But if you were to do this uh, for yourself, you would have the program downloaded. You would find the de novo uh, map Perl script. You'd give it the input of again just the FASTQ files. You do need to tell it a population map, and so you can do this two uh, multiple ways. The two most common are if you know what population that individual uh, belongs to based on sampling, you can do that. Or you can also just keep where each individual is its own population in a, in a sense uh, to call uh, uh, SNPs that way. Some of the downstream programs, it does make a difference of, of, of how these are summarized, but the actual calling of the SNPs, uh, I haven't seen a difference um, that, in that approach. Uh, in these two approaches. And then the command again, you're specifying the output folder and additional options such as a number of threads. And so that can give you a good idea of the SNPs you have with little uh, other genomic resources available. If you have it, the reference-based approach can be a bit better in, in many aspects, but not always. Uh, so the, the wet lab preparation is going to be the exact same way of how you generate, how you extract the DNA, how you prep the samples, the differences is in the bioinformatic capacity. Uh, so you do need to have some form of reference genome to map reads to. It does not need to be a great reference genome, um, but it needs to be uh, something to map the reads to. And this reference approach, it does help, make, help to make sure that non-homologous loci are not collapsed into the same region. So with the de novo clustering, we may see we have two clusters down here. But in reality, with the reference approach, we see that actually this region two or this cluster two is two distinct regions. And so with the reference approach, those will be separated out. Whereas in the de novo approach, there's not enough information to really highlight where those differences are. And so does a reference genome help? And I would say absolutely it can, especially in terms of the number of SNPs that you can identify. And so <clears throat> here's a recent study uh, where we, um, along with uh, Adriana Hernandez at Cornell, we were looking at Calicordus venistus to see some population uh, uh, genetic uh, input and, and phenotypic differences. And we first uh, set out to do the novo approach. And you can see here, I have the raw number of SNPs called and the filtered number of SNPs called. 
we started out the novo approach a couple thousand snips we had a couple different iterations of the of the reference genome that we were building and as we went along with a better and better reference we see that the number of snips that we were able to call goes up a lot and so we are more confident in the results we have but again this is still a very at least this last example here is a very fragmented genome but it allowed us to actually map our our RADC data to it to find out where the differences occur. And so I think, as I would say, uh, a reference genome definitely helps. Even a poor draft genome uh, can increase the ability to call SNPs. It may not help with some of the, some of the doing GWAS and some other analyses, but it can be very helpful um, for a lot of the downstream analyses. And then just another piece of does a reference genome help? So a, another uh, study recently, this time with uh, Lorena Villanueva, we looked at the Washingtonia palms. And for this, is, we did a lot of kind of uh, uh, population uh, phylogenetics and, and, uh, and network analyses. And so for this, we had a few samples as an outgroup, which was in a different genus. And when we were calling SNPs, both for a de novo approach and a reference guided approach, those outgroup samples actually disappeared from analysis with the de novo. There wasn't enough overlap there with the in group to have a high confidence in the number of SNPs per individual. Um, but, and so we see that here, de novo, none of the individuals were kept. And then the reference uh, approach, this is that we had uh, several thousand SNPs remaining. Our in group uh, number of SNPs obviously did did change quite a bit too. And so we, we did the downstream analyses in both ways using de novo and reference guide approach to make sure we were able to include those out groups and to make sure that we weren't biasing any kind of our inference. And so there is some uh, concern that using a reference definitely can lead to a bias. And if you look at uh, down here from a paper 2017, the kind of the percent of missing data and the proportion of supported nodes, you can see that the reference had, uh, it responded a bit differently than the Nova approach. And so again, in this case, I can't say, you know, that a reference approach is always the best way, but it's definitely worth considering and it can help out in a lot of cases in terms of number of SNPs and your individuals that you retain. So this isn't, again, necessarily the focus here, but if you wanted to, if you don't have a reference genome, if you do want to build one, uh, there's a, a, a workshop that uh, some colleagues and I have done. Uh, we did last year for the Botany uh, uh, Summer Conference as well as for this coming year. Um, all the, the materials are available on GitHub about how to uh, lay out an experimental design to sequence the genome, uh, assemble a genome, annotate the genome, and use that for downstream analyses. So if you're working on a system that doesn't have genetic resources, it is possible to, to build that and a rough estimate of the cost for a draft genome with, with a one gig with a one gig genome is around a little over $3,000. So just want to highlight that. Again, uh, the link for this is embedded in the slides if you want to check out that workshop material later on. So this is still with the reference based RADSEQ. Again, if you're doing this on your uh, own system, again, there's a Perl uh, script wrapper that will run through all the steps for you of, uh, to uh, build the loci from the reference from each individual, call the SNPs, symbol this into a catalog, and then match that catalog with all the individuals you have. The input for that is very similar to what we had before with the de novo approach. This time, instead of giving it the input of the FASTQ files, you will give it a, a, a sorted BAM file for each individual map to your reference, and you'll have your population map as well. Uh, and then it will give you a BCF file of all the SNPs. One thing that is often overlooked, and this, is, this can be true for a lot of things, and we will be doing this in the tutorial today, the hands-off tutorial, is we need to map our reads to our reference. And this approach can be overlooked in a lot of ways. There are many different options out there. 
for doing this. And there are often, there are, are several comparisons about which one works best, uh, which approach there's options, BWA MIM and the new version BWA MIM2, Minimap2, Bowtie, et cetera. There's a lot of them out there. And from a, a, a paper now that's several years old, there was this quote that the portion of reads that can be mapped is one factor, but not necessarily the most appropriate one. So if you're looking at the reads map, yes, that's very important, but your on target hits with the same data can vary quite a bit uh, based on the approaches you take. If you look at the comparisons of several recent papers, uh, BWA MIM and BWA MIM2, the re more recent version, often uh, perform best for Lumina data for long read data, PacBio, Nanopore, maybe Minimap2 or something similar will be better. And then once you have your reads mapped to save computational space and, and time for some analyses, we will take that resulting uh, SAM file, which results from the mapping and convert that to a sorted BAM file, which is a bit smaller in size and a lot of the programs uh, require that. And so now we're getting into what we're going to be doing today for the tutorial. And so uh, I have given the code as if you were doing this on your own system in the command line. And then if we have an app to do this for you in the discovery environment, we have the, the cyber symbol here. And so for all these analysis we're coming up here, um, again, I want to give you the command line, but also we have built in apps to do this. And so for SNP calling, again, with the reference genome um, that we'll be doing today, the first step is to index your FASTA file to specify the genetic coordinates so it knows exactly where things are. So this is done in BWA, and the code is just BWA index, and then whatever your genome assembly file is. Once your genome is indexed, now you can start mapping your reads from each of your FASTQ files to that uh, index reference. And when I do the mapping, this is a BWA mem, I will uh, include regroups uh, in most cases, especially when I'm doing this on the command line, for, uh, which includes information uh, to identify the samples, maybe what plate they were, what lane they were run on, et cetera, which will help uh, in some of the downstream analyses and so the, uh, the command for that, again, is BWA mem will give it the read group information. And I have these kind of specified here. So we'll have the sample ID. So it needs to be a unique identifier. Uh, the sample name, if, especially if you have, say, multiple sequencing runs for the same individuals that are being pulled, it's important to make sure that those are the same. So those samples can be pulled together. But you do need to have that unique identifier for each sequencing run, and then you can include sequencing equipment, run identifier, library count, information to help you know what is, what is there, how they differ. And then you'll give it your genome sequence, and you'll give it either the forward and forward reverse sequences if you have that. And then the output for this is that SAM file, which then we will convert downstream. And so when we're doing this, this approach, so we were talking about RAD-seq beforehand. Now, if we go back to say doing HYPE-seq, genome resequencing, RNA-seq, some of these other different approaches, there are a lot of commonly used programs out there to call SNPs. Uh, there's really no shortage of options and there's new ones coming around all the time. Older ones are being improved. Some of the major differences though, between these approaches are maximum likelihood versus a Bayesian framework or a haplotype method versus site-based method. And they all potentially can give uh, different results. Here's a, a table from a paper last year showing just a couple of different options, Freebase, GATK, SAM tools, uh, Varscan, and others and kind of what the algorithm they use, the pipeline, um, and some of the default parameters. Again, there may not be necessarily one, 
there's not always a single case where a single program works the best. But they've had several comp uh, comparisons between these. And, and one thing to keep in mind is that all the SNP callers uh, are not created equal. There's many factors involved, accuracy, uh, time, computational time, computational resources that goes into this. And, a, and a, again, another recent uh, comparison, it showed that Freebase, GATK, and SAM tools, uh, the MPILOT function of SAM tools, had the lowest number of missed calls. However, um, Freebase, Varscan, and Vardict were uh, more sensitive to unique calls, and this high sensitivity can result in a higher false positive rate. And so testing for these true positives, uh, some of the percentage that, like the, the ones that were the, the highest percentage of true positives, SAM tools and Pileup was the highest, uh, GATK and Freebase were next in line, um, doing fairly well. And when you look at the comparisons overall, it, in most cases, you see that a combination of using BWA MIM plus GATK. So BWA MIM for mapping your reads, GATK for calling SNPs gives you the best uh, results for most genomes. However, for more complex genomes, if you have a large genome, if it's a polyploid such as the wheat, um, there's the recommendation that maybe BWA MIM and SAM tools uh, is recommended. But for the workshop today, the tutorial, we're going to stick with this BWA MIM and GATK approach uh, to call our SNPs on our small test data set. For GATK, there's a lot of resources out there already. Uh, and most of these are, are very, very good. There's a best practices uh, uh, kind of walkthrough um, of some of the best ways to do this. Uh, I have the link here. It's definitely going to follow through. We're going to go through a lot of the same steps here as they talk about doing there. And so, um, you know, going from mapping the reads, calling duplicates, uh, processing your BAM files, then calling SNPs, and then uh, filtering downstream. So for GATK, the code, again, if you're doing this on the command line version, uh, here are the different steps. So, again, we have. Uh, apps for all these in the discovery environment. So you'll first create a dictionary uh, of your assembly, your genome assembly. You'll create that dictionary. So you know how many contigs, how, how big they are, uh, the number of bases. And you also index this uh, assembly with SAM tools. And then um, after mapping to the genome, you will have a uh, a SAM file, which will convert to BAM. Then once it's converted to BAM, we need to index it. So again, those kind of will match up based on the information we have in our uh, index genome. And then we can run through each individual sample with the haplotype caller function and JTK. And for this, you're going to specify the reference genome. You're going to give it the index BAM file that we have. And the output of this is going to be a, a GBCF file of kind of the initial SNPs called in this GBCF format. Once we get to this point, we're almost there. We're almost done, but not quite. Where we, so we have SNPs now called for each individual sample, but only for those variants that are in that sample. And so you can see that you, you can think about in some cases where some individuals will match the reference exactly for given loci, others will differ. So we want to include all that information now <coughs> when we call our, our SNPs to use for downstream analyses. So we want a file that represents all individuals and all variants. So we will combine all of our GBCF files into one file. And then uh, using, and so that's going to be using the combined GBCFs function. And then we will genotype those GBCFs all at the same time to this joint genotyping. So then our output now 
is a all samples with all the variants in a VCF format that we can use. In case you haven't seen a VCF file recently uh, or at all, here is a what that resulting file will look like. So we have a bunch of information here at the top, which is formatting uh, and info about what is included um, in the file itself downstream, uh, what the different columns represent, the amount of information that is there. We also have information about uh, the number of contigs and how big those are. This again comes from that indexing and dictionary function we did earlier. And then at the bottom, we have where each line is a, a variant and each column is a individual. And so all of our information now is stored this way and that can be used for the downstream analyses. This is just a rough uh, schematic of what we will be going through with the Discovery Environment GATK analysis pipeline. It follows very closely to the uh, best practices. So we'll start, we will um, index our reference genome, map our reads to this, convert that SAM file to a BAM file. Then we will uh, create a dictionary and index our reference genome. We will mark duplicates, make sure our read group information is all correct and then index that SAM file or that, that BAM file, excuse me, in SAM tools. Then we will go through the haplotype caller for each individual, combine the, the GVCFs into one, and then we'll do the genotype function. I just want to remind everybody that with the discovery environment, we do have limited resources, eight CPUs and I think 16 gigs of RAM at most. This will be enough uh, to run through this test data set relatively quickly. But for larger data sets, um, it can take a long time to run. And some of these analyses will take a, a lot more RAM than is available here. So I, I, I'm seeing a question uh, in the chat. And um, <laughs> there's definitely way. Uh, so I have here these combined GV, GVCFs function. Um, and this works. There's a another function called uh, in GATK, the genomics DB. And uh, that one often works much faster and uh, has less computational requirements uh, in terms of uh, resulting files that it creates. However, at least in, in uh, past versions of GATK, the genomics DB cause problems if you want to export all sites in your, uh, in your reference genome, not just the variant sites. So if you want to export variants and invariants, the genomics DB function caused problems in a, a, the last couple of versions of GATK. That may be fixed now. Um, so combined GB, GBCFs work better in that case. But if you have a big data set, hundreds, thousands of individuals, I think the, the, the genomics DB uh, does work a bit faster. Just a couple of uh, final things to kind of finish up before we move into the hands-on stuff. With GATK, uh, it can be frustrating for a lot of people. Uh, it can be a difficult program to learn. Um, however, there is extensive documentation discussion boards, uh, active discussion boards, tutorials. If you have problems uh, with error messages, you can uh, write to uh, the folks who, who keep it up to date and they are very good about addressing things. However, I have had problems going from one version of the GATK to the another where functions will change, flags will change, and the documentation isn't always the best. Uh, with that. So if you have tested it out on one version beforehand and are moving to another one, that can be a problem. Um, scalability. So again, with the number of, of for the programs, 
the number of, or the size of the project, the number of threads, processors that you give it, do not always increase or I mean decrease the, the wall time used. And so here's an example where you, the more threads you give it to a certain point, your wall time doesn't change, meaning the amount of time a run takes. And so scalability doesn't always match. And again, version control issues uh, can be a real problem uh, for the user. However, the discussion boards and other things can be very helpful. And also to keep a look uh, out for the most up-to-date tutorials um, for the newest version is important. The one last thing I'll talk about, which we're not really going to get into today at all, because um, we're here, we're just talking about how to generate our SNP data. But once you have your SNPs, you often want to filter that data uh, to keep only high quality, high confidence things, or certain regions, certain chromosomes that you may have, or to prune for linkage equilibrium and whatnot. There are several options out there. Um, this kind of goes beyond the scope of today, but some of those options are BCF tools, BCF tools, and GATK, there's some, some embedded methods for that. I have found that VCF tools is super easy to implement. Uh, it's often not very picky about specific formatting or other issues that you may have. However, it has limited options, but the options that are there are quite clear in the user manual. It can be quite slow for large data sets. If you have hundreds of taxa and millions of SNPs, it may take a while to run. And most importantly, the standard VCF tools does not work on polyploid data. And so have doing something like BCF tools does. However, with BCF tools, it's a bit harder to implement for basic filtering, but it's way more powerful and way faster, especially with large data sets. And so uh, if you can learn how to do what you need to in BCF tools, it may work better for you, but it takes a while to, to get there. And BCF tools is often, or is actively supported and distributed alongside SAM tools. With the filtering, and this is in the, the GitHub tutorial, uh, there's another script along with it, but if you wanted to filter your set and your SNPs that you got with BCF tools, uh, you can keep only bilobic sites, say uh, filter for percentage of missing data, read depth, et cetera. Here's what some of that code looks like. So you have your VCF tools command. You tell it if it's a, it's a BCF or a GZIP BCF, you give it the options and you wanna make sure that you tell it to recode and recode info for all. And then you output the, the, um, the prefix for your file and then you would have a filtered SNPs uh, BCF file, which then you can look at depth, missing uh, percentage of, of data from individuals and so forth. In the tutorial, after we call SNPs, the last part we'll be looking at Koji, um, if we have time for that. So this is the Koji is the comparative genomics, uh, it's part of uh, Cyverse, or you can launch it from Cyverse, where this has over, 54,000 genomes from over 20,000 uh, organisms stored online. Most of those are available to the public. For this particular case, we can upload our resulting BCF file because our original uh, genome file, FASTA file came from, from Koji or is in Koji. And we can, we can visualize where some of these SNP differences are, uh, the different types of SNPs that we see. And there's plenty of other options out there for, for Koji, it's very powerful. Um, but that in itself is, a, is kind of for a different workshop. The tutorial today, again, we're going to be using Utricularia Gibba. So this is a small test data set that we have. Uh, there's a PDF for the uh, Discovery Environment Walkthrough, GATK, on GitHub. Uh, this link is in the chat, and it's also on the slides. <clears throat> so our data is all publicly available data. Um, we have a high quality genome assembly. We have RNA-seq data from multiple types of organs. Uh, and so we can call SNPs based on that. Uh, for some things, you know, that may not be the best approach we talked about earlier, but it's a nice contained data set. Uh, it runs well on the discovery environment. Also will run fast on your own local machine if you want to do it on the command line version. Uh, you can do um, 
SNP calling, we've done it both for both stacks and GATK, which is what, what the, the tutorial is. And then there are will be some options for filtering the data set and doing a PCA uh, downstream if you want to do. For the dashboard analyses, again, there's that GWAS uh, workshop coming up soon. This last February, I also did a, a webinar using discovery environment as well for a lot of these pop gene analyses, doing uh, structure analyses, doing PCA, building some trees, doing some uh, neighbor nets. And so the, there's a, uh, a tutorial um, and walkthrough available for that, as well as recording if you haven't seen that yet. Um, so that can be very helpful for after you generate your SNPs for what do you want to do next. Just some final conclusions before we get to the, the online part. Every project may demand a modified SNPCon approach, especially if you have a large genome, if you have polyploid individuals, how your sampling is impacted or how your sampling is implemented. These can all change your analysis uh, approach and downstream analyses. Again, polyploid large genomes, availability of data and quality for a reference genome is important. SNP filtering, is sometimes it seems more of an art than a science. There's a ton of different parameters to be explored uh, and the same parameters may not fit, or will not fit for each data set. So you do need to see how it fits for yours to trade off between number of loci kept and number of individuals with data kept. Hopefully there's a ton of information already that we've already went through. We'll do some of the hands-on stuff in the next few moments. Hopefully this is a good start. But there's a ton of other intricacies as we as you go through for your particular uh, project, and I and unfortunately we can't have all the answers in one place. But really hoping this kind of starts everybody on the right path uh, to get to some of the analysis they want to do. So I just want to take a few moments, see if there's any questions, allow people to sign on to the discovery environment in Cyverse and to download the tutorial from GitHub. Um, and so if there's any questions now about anything that I covered, happy to address those, but also we'll have some time at the end uh, to ask if you have more specific questions about a project or analyses, maybe save those for the, the end. But if there's more general questions, I'd be happy to take those now. Trying to get everything set up here. And so if you haven't yet, if you follow the link in GitHub uh, on the in the chat to the GitHub, <clears throat> there is the discovery environment tutorial. This is a PDF. This will walk through uh, a lot of those steps that I showed in the slides with the uh, commands. This will set up, show you the apps to use for that. Um, the slides from today are also in PDF workshop or a PDF format. They have a, a downstream uh, SNP filtering script. We talked about that a little bit, but it's involved here as well if you want to see it. And I will make sure the uh, PCA script is also uploaded if you want to test that out as well later on. Um, but all the main pieces are here. All the data all that we will need for the tutorial is already in the Cyverse and the community data. So that's public. It's available for everybody. Um, so everybody can access that. Um, as you walk through the tutorial. And so I'm going to try to set it up here uh, where you can see the steps of the tutorial on the bottom and my web browser on top. It's going to be a little hard to see. So if you kind of follow along yourself, that may work the best. Um, but so if you go to the Cyverse, okay, so before I get going here, so what is the difference between 
coverage and depth and snip calling. Um, so those are often used interchangeably to a certain extent. There is sequencing depth and there is SNP coverage, which are not the same. So um, if you go to, go to sequence an individual using Illumina data, you may shoot for 20X coverage. So if you have, um, if you have a, uh, say a one gig genome individual, and you want to sequence 20X coverage, you will need to get 20 gigs of data, 20 gigabases of sequencing data. Now, the, the hope is that that's evenly distributed across the genome, which we know is not the case. There's repetitive elements and whatnot that are sequenced higher. And so we often report our sequencing depth, sequencing coverage, and then when we call SNPs, we will have our, our SNP coverage. So what is the depth or how, at, for each SNP we have, what is the, uh, how many reads cover that? I Meaning, so how confident are we of what we see? Homozygous versus heterozygous. And so oftentimes when you're in a study, you may report your sequencing coverage and also, or your sequencing depth and your SNP coverage. But coverage and depth itself can be used for multiple things. All right, so if you are in Cybers, when you first go to cybers.org, uh, go to login. I believe everybody should have an account. If not, you can create accounts. Um, I have one, so I'm gonna hit login again down here. And you type in your username and your password. And then you are in the Cybers user portal. And for this, we have many different options. Uh, it may be different for each of you, depending on what you have requested access to. I have the discovery environment, uh, atmosphere, data commons, which is where a lot of the data will be stored, and Koji, which we will use a little bit later on. Uh, for now, make sure you launch the discovery environment. And once you launch that, you will likely need to sign in again. And so once you have logged in to the discovery environment, you should see your, uh, you should see the logout button up here. And along the left-hand side, we have different options, uh, data, apps, analyses, um, and teams and so forth. So most of what we're doing today will be in data, apps, and analyses. So as you're kind of getting stuff set up, I'm looking at the chat as well. Can we have a little specific expression on SAM tools uh, for SNP calling on transcriptomes about, or GATK? Um, so I'm not entirely certain about a little specific expression or for SNP calling or, well, I'm not sure exactly. So SNP calling for specific alleles. I mean, when you call the SNPs on GATK, they would come up as uh, polymorphic in that particular site. Um, so I guess I'm not entirely certain of, of what uh, all the question is on that one, but we can address that a little bit later on. All right, so for the tutorial, yeah, so I'm looking at the tutorial now. So what we have done, we've logged in. Um, the one thing I do want to make sure that everybody does, so if you click on your data tab, you should see your username, and then you may see several different uh, folders here. I'm going to go to analyses, 
And then I'm going to create a new folder for today to store, to be my working directory. So I'm gonna click on this new folder icon and I'm going to call it uh, AG2 oh, PI snip. And it may take a moment to create. And so I'm gonna make sure when I run all these analyses, which is on the tutorial, to make sure I select this particular uh, folder so that all of my uh, intermediate files, all my resulting files are here in one place, and make it easier to move downstream as we go through. Now, all the data we'll need. So if you go to your username up here and you should see your username, data shared with me and community data. If you click community data, uh, you should see this top option as the AG2PI uh, workshop May 2021. If you click on that, you should see all the input files that we'll need and intermediate files in case things take a while to create. And so we have our reference genome here. We have our a subset of Illumina data to run fast here in the Ugiva Illumina. I'll just show that. So here we have uh, only R1, so the, the forward reads of several different samples from different organ types. And then we also have the intermediate files of SAM files for mapping and the sorted BAM files at the end uh, for SNPcon if we need. And then I also have a uh, kind of a combined VCF here variant call of just the variant calls uh, if we need that for uh, Koji later on. And so you should see, this is all the information about where things are. Uh, so for almost all the analyses, we will just leave the data in the community folder. However, it's gonna be easiest if you have the FASTA file, uh, the reference FASTA file in your working directory. And so that is, should be very easy to get if you click on the check mark next to it and then click on these three little dots you should see download. So you'll, you can download this to your uh, computer here. And this is a relatively small. And then if you go back, once it's downloaded, if you go back to your working directory that you created, you can click upload and uh, browse local. And so here is that file I just downloaded. I'm going to upload that. And right now it's in the queue for uploading. This is the only file that we need to make sure we have in our directory um, because we're going to index it and do a few other things with it. And so it's, we need to have all that information together. All the re the individual samples reads those can all be in your the community data. We don't need those right now. So I'm going to see if it's done uploading. It appears to not. It still be, appears to be in the queue. So I'm just looking at the chat again, and there's a comment about uh, exporting all sites. So invariant, invariant. And uh, this is a very uh, important thing. If, if you have looked, you know, if you follow uh, some of the pop gen stuff on Twitter, this is definitely a kind of a big uh, thing the last couple of months about some summary statistics, heterozygosity and other things uh, being calculated by variant sites only or within variant sites. And so there is a easy way to do a haplotype caller to uh, export at the base pair resolution. So export all bases. Um, and you can definitely do that. And for some analyses, you definitely need to do that. However, when you do that, especially with larger genome individuals, organisms, those files can be quite huge and they can take a little bit longer to run. And so, to get around that, uh, some of these approaches for calculating uh, summary statistics 
will rely on the BAM file. So what is mapped to your reference genome and not necessarily just your BCF file. But um, this is where a little bit of planning, uh, experimental design for what you want to do, uh, figuring out if you need to have that base pair resolution or not is important. But just keep in mind that it does make your run times longer. It does make the file sizes bigger. And for certain things, you can, if you can use the BAM files instead of the, the BCF files, it might be a bit easier to do. Well, that is a great point that is brought up. And again, summarizing some of these things, there are biases for sure of using just variant versus variant and invariant sites alone. Let's see here. It appears that, yep. So mine has been uploaded now. And so again, this is my working directory, uh, AG2, AG2PI SNP. There is my FASTA file. And now we can go through the different steps on how to do this. I will definitely do the first couple as we start going. So the first thing is we want to index this reference file. And there's an app. So I took screenshots here of the different apps that we have. So in this case, BWA index uh, 0 0.74. So if we go into the search at the top and you do just BWA, and then you click on apps, you can see the different options for BWA apps and the discovery environment at the moment. Uh, so we have a line index, we have MIM. So we, at the moment, are going to do BWA index. Click on that. We can leave the uh, analysis name default. And here, the output folder, we want to change to our current working directory. So you click on browse uh, and we're going to select this AG, AG2PI, select current. So now everything that's gonna be created is gonna be written to this folder, which is what we want. Now, if we click next, you can see what we need to do. We need to tell it a FASTA file to index. So again, we go to our folder, we see here's our FASTA file, select that and hit okay. We're going to leave the construction algorithm as auto and uncheck this box of uh, the naming scheme. We're not going to use this right now. Once you do that, you can hit next. You want to specify the number of cores that you need to sequence to try to keep things going as fast as possible. We'll do eight and we'll do two gigs of RAM and two gigs of storage space. These files are relatively small. With the larger data sets, you're going to need more than that. But for this, it should run just fine. The more resources you ask for now here, the longer it'll take to get in the queue and run. You hit next, and then it's, it's going to be a summary of things of what you requested. And then you hit launch. This is going to take you to the analysis uh, button here. And so this is allow you to keep an eye on what is running. So I have some jobs from before that have completed. And you can see that now I have this one running. So you can keep an eye on what you have. Uh, we can't move into the next step yet of mapping until our reference is indexed. So this part should only take a couple minutes and we're gonna let that uh, progress before we move on to the mapping of BWA MIM. Is anybody running into any uh, issues with the discovery environment so far? Have you been able to find the tutorial, the walkthrough, everything going okay? I will take the silence to say that everything is okay. So this indexing part, at least for the size of genome we have, should take only uh, a few minutes. 
If I'm going too fast, uh, I do apologize for that. Uh, I know it's difficult when you have a, a, a wide range of maybe background expertise or, or use of cybers. Um, my hope is that the tutorial is very much straightforward and you can walk through that at any at your pace at any time. All the data is again publicly available. Uh, so you can run through that on, on this data set. If you wanted to modify it for your own data set, you can, but larger data sets will take longer to run and you may not have all the resources necessary to run those. Um, but the test data set will allow you to go through completion of generating a VCF file with no problem. And so my indexing is still continuing. Um, it should pop up when it is done. I'm just going to try to refresh this. I'm going to look at the, my data folder just to make sure nothing's there. We do have some log files. We have some other files that are uh, looks to be have written. Oh, and if I go back to my analysis folder, I just got the, the indication that that run is completed. Uh, so this hasn't updated quite yet, but it will. So it'll tell you what the start time is and what the end time is. Um, so that can help you keep track of how much resources you need. Uh, once it's done, let me go back here to see if it will actually show up now. And so, yeah, so mine it has completed now. Uh, BW index is done. It took three, just over three minutes to complete. So now if we look at our, go back to our working directory here. Before we just had this FASTA file. Now we have a log file of, of what has happened and we have the uh, resulting files from the index. Uh, we do not need to mess with any of these at the moment. Uh, the program just needs to have access to these. And so the fact that our reference genome and these files are on the same folder, and we will pick this folder for the downstream analyses, we should be completely fine. Step two, I'm going to get this started because this can take a few, this can take up to five minutes or more with this data set. Step two is to map our reads to our reference or index reference genome using BWA MEM. So going back up to the search bar, if we go BWA MEM, we look at our apps and we see that we have the one that we need, the 7.15. We click on that. Again, we can keep the names the same, the analysis name. We do want to make sure we change our output folder. So again, we're going to make sure that it is this AGTPI. Select that. You see the change there. Now we have our, our inputs. We have a little bit of a background about what this, uh, the readme, what this is going on here. Our inputs are all listed on the walkthrough. For the left read file, we're going to select it. We need to, now again, all of our read data is in the community data. So we need to click on our username, go to community data. We see our workshop here. So select that. We need to go to the Illumina data, select that. And we're going to just use this first sample, this you give a bladder sample one. So we're gonna, we're gonna check that and hit okay. If you had paired data, you would select the right read, so the R2. We don't have that right now. So we're just gonna go with the, with the first part. <coughs> Specifying the reference genome is mandatory. Uh, so you can select it from a list if it's there. 
but we're going to do a custom reference genome based on what we've just indexed. So you go to browse. Again, we're back in our data. So click on our working directory and we're going to select our FASTA file and hit OK. Uh, we're going to leave the alignment options as default. So none of this needs to be changed. Uh, we're going to keep the output as default as well. And we're going to hit next. Here again for the cores, we're going to stick with eight. And we're going to do two gigs of memory and two gigs of disk, disk space. And hit next. Again, this will just summarizes the parameters that we selected. Most of them are default for this particular case. And we're going to launch the analysis. And it's submitted. Uh, it may take a few moments to run, depending on how busy the system is. We just switched over to running. I just want to highlight real quick as people are getting those running. So this mapping part can take quite a while. The subset of data we have is only 250,000 reads for each. So not really enough to accurately call SNPs, but enough to run through this pipeline. This mapping now will take about five minutes. If we had our full data set, which is like 7 million SNPs for each, uh, 7 million reads for each file, that would take about two hours for each sample to map to the reference genome. Uh, and so it, it, it does take a while. And so, um, we're going to be done much faster, but we're not going to have the amount of data there. The one thing I do want to point out that with this app, the default met the default is to create a file called BWA output .sam. And it's going to be the same way each time. <coughs> so we need to rename our output file after each run so we don't overwrite it. And so when our when this run is complete, we need to change BWA output .sam, in this case to you give a bladder r one and we will for our sample one. So we will I will show you that when it's complete, but something just to keep in mind that with the app, you need to make sure you rename the output. If you were doing this on your own command line, you could specify ahead of time what that output file should should be. So you wouldn't need to, to go back each time and change to modify the output. And again, this one can take a few minutes, five minutes or a little bit more to run on the small data set, but that should give us um, relatively fast so we can go through the rest of the downstream uh, portions coming up. And again, if you have, um, you know, if it runs faster for you or if you want to try to do multiple things at a time, uh, again, the tutorial is, uh, should be straightforward of all the different steps you need to do with all the inputs and outputs and things you need to change. So you can kind of walk through that at your own speed as necessary. Apparently, I've lost my window.
it looks like things are still kind of uh, chugging along here. Should be just a few more minutes probably before this first mapping step is done. All right, so I see a, a, a question in the chat. I will uh, <coughs> address that in just a moment as we get the next uh, set of analyses running. So my BWA mem completed. I want to go back to data and our working directory. And let's see, where is it? Here's our output, our BWA output.sam. So we need to change that for our particular uh, sample, which is should be pretty easy to do. So if you check the box next to it, and you click on these three little dots here, you should see rename. So we're gonna rename that to you give a, and that's our, our species we're working with, bladder for organ type and R1 for our sample one, and hit rename. And it's in progress and it should be done in a matter of seconds. And it's finished. So I'm gonna re-click on our window just to see kind of how things look. Let me go back actually. Uh, come on, analysis. So now here's our sample. So we went from BWA output default to uh, Sam or to our, our, our name plus Sam. And then the next step is to convert it from our Sam to a BAM format. Again, this is gonna be uh, sorted. It's gonna be uh, a little bit more efficient memory wise and, and smaller in size. For this, we're going to use Sam tools <coughs> to go back to our search function at the top. We look at our apps. And again, for SAM tools, there's quite a few of those, but I know that SAM tools 1.7, SAM to BAM, SAM to sorted BAM actually what we need. So this one right here as on the tutorial, we're going to click on that. Uh, again, our name could be the same our folder, we're going to change that or make sure that we have our current working folder, which we do. And you're going to click next. Uh, and so our input file, we're going to browse and we're going to select our you give a bladder R1 Sam and our output name is going to be a little bit different, but we're going to change it to whoop, you give a bladder sample one sorted BAM. Now you can call it almost whatever you want. I like to leave the sorted BAM in there so that or sorted dot BAM so I know for a fact that it has been sorted. If it hasn't, that's going to cause problems downstream. And our output format is BAM. There's other options you can do, but for now we're going to do BAM. And we're going to sort by coordinates. <coughs> you can sort by renames, but I wouldn't suggest that. We need the coordinates right now to know along the genome where things are. Once you have that, you can hit next. Again, like before, we're going to use eight cores two gigs of memory and two gigs of space. This will run fairly fast. We're gonna take a quick look at our parameters, output file name, output file type, sort by coordinates, and we should be good. We're gonna launch that job.
This one will take a few minutes to run. When it is done, you should see that sorted BAM file in our directory um, along with the SAM file. So I'm taking a look at the chat right now as others are working through this. There's a question about for DD rad experiment uh, recommendation that the paired reads uh, overlap. Um, so I am not a hundred percent sure on this. <clears throat> Most of my sequencing has been uh, for rad seek has been single ends because uh, we don't. So if we do a DD rad, we kind of do the kind of the more traditional uh, rad where I fragment uh, with covariance after shearing or after one restriction enzyme. But I do know that if your reads overlap, I mean, I guess you're, you're getting uh, some of the same basis sequenced twice. For genome resequencing, it's often best if the reads do not overlap so that the insert size is larger than your read length um, to kind of maximize what you are, are, are sequencing. Um, so I don't really have a, a specific answer to this question. I guess I would say follow the protocol or the recommendation of uh, the sequencing core or whoever's setting it up. Um, I'm not really sure uh, what is best uh, in this particular case because I haven't ran DD rad before. All right, so my conversion just completed, my SAM to BAM. Let's take a quick look at that. So now we see we have our, our SAM file still on our folder. We now have our sorted BAM. <coughs> and so now we are getting much closer to be able to call SNPs. We now know where those sequences, how they match up to our reference genome. So the first two pieces here are going to be to prepare our a uh, genome assembly file uh, to be able to sequence, to be uh, called again. So this is going to be creating the dictionary to know the number of contexts, chromosomes, and the sizes, and to index those. So the first part, now we're getting to GATK itself, is to um, create the sequence dictionary. And you can see that app right here. So we click on that. You can see what the input files need to be. Our first, we're going to make sure we're in the correct folder. <coughs> and then we're going to hit next. Now our reference sequence is the one that we've been messing with up to this point or dealing with the you give a FASTA file. So hit OK. And the output is going to be basically the same file name, but instead of .fasta, it's going to be to be .dic, so .dictionary. Uh, but make sure the file name matches up. If it's not the same, there will be problems when the computer, when the program can't find the file. So again, make sure that the file names before the extension are identical. We're going to hit next. This one can take a little bit fewer resources. So we're going to do four CPU cores with our RAM and disk space the same. And we're going to launch that analysis. Now, because we are dealing with our index file and we only use four cores then, we can actually jump into indexing that FASTA file at the same time. And so here we're going to use, um, we're going to use, and we're going to index that FASTA file. <coughs> so let me see if I can pull up that app. So index FASTA file with SAM tools. So here that is. Again, make sure our working directory is the same. 
And the the input for this is just the reference file that we've been that we have been dealing with so far, the FASTA file. So we're going to hit OK. Again, we've already used <clears throat> four CPUs, so we're going to use the remaining four now to index this. And we're going to hit Next and Launch Analysis. So if you look at your analyses window, you may see two things running. <clears throat> we have our dictionary running and our indexing <clears throat> was just submitted. I'm doing this a little bit faster just because I want to make sure uh, I get to the point of where we can actually uh, run haplotype caller. And we may or may not get to the point of the last two steps <clears throat> being the uh, combined GBCF and the actual genotyping. But once we get to the haplotype caller step, um, the last two steps are. Uh, should be uh, pretty easy to do. And so if you look at their tutorial, the next step, number six, is mark duplicates. Now, this is something that we would normally do. Uh, we are going to skip that for today, though. However, you see that the you see the app for this is the GATK mark duplicates. Uh, if you are running RADSeq analyses, I would say you probably should not do this, the mark duplicates with RADSeq because you may not get anything. Uh, all your duplicates will be marked. However, if you're doing uh, exome capture data, uh, genome resequencing data, anything where there's an extra PCR step, it's a better, it's better option to mark this. You know, your duplicates may be, or PCR duplicates could, could be eight to 10%, maybe a bit more. But with RADSeq, you often have higher levels of that. So for the time being, I'm going to skip that step here. And so the next couple steps that we need to do are again our GATK. Uh, so our indexing is completed, but our dictionary has not. So I'm going to go back to our steps. So this one is to make sure are, um, no, we have some annotation stuff going on here. So one thing, we, when we did BAWA in this particular uh, app, we did not specify read groups. We did not specify a sequence name or identity or sample name. <clears throat> so that's what we need to do. And we're gonna do this for each of our samples and similar to what was in that uh, the slides earlier some of our information that we have that we're going to specify um, <clears throat> is uh, so we're going to talk about our sample name so that's going to be straight that's going to be very much straightforward um, and then some other prep work uh, so this is RNA seq data sequence on aluminum maybe it was in batch number one these things can well could potentially change based on your experimental setup, but it is important to have it there if you can, because you can separate things out bioinformatically down the road if necessary. All right, so looking at my discovery environment, our runs have uh, completed. So if I go to data and I look here, now here's my dictionary we created and my indexed FASTA file, my FAI <coughs> is there now. So we have our, our pieces ready to go for the genome. And so we need to do two more things for our samples to make sure that we are good to go. 
Um, the first of that is to add our read groups. So if we go to GATK and we look at add or replace read groups. <clears throat> Again, we're going to make sure our folder is the correct folder. And then we'll hit next. So our input file is our BAM, is our sorted BAM file. <laughs> so we want to make sure we select that. Hit OK. For this particular analysis, our read group library is one. Our platform is Illumina. Our unit is RNA seq. And our sample name, which is arguably, arguably the most important here, is you give a bladder sample one. Our output file, we want to specify that we have our read groups included. So I'm going to change it from our you give a <coughs> um, sample one sorted, sorted dot uh, BAM to include this read group dot BAM here. And I know there's a space there, it doesn't need to be there. So now we have <clears throat> included that information to help us out later down the road. We're gonna go back to eight cores here. Uh, we'll do four gigs and four gigs of RAM and storage because GATK can take a bit more. And we're going to launch these analyses. And so as the tutorial states, if you are going to, um, so normally you'd wanna run through all these steps for all of our samples. We're just doing the bladder uh, sample one at the moment. Uh, but if you were to do this uh, for the entire data set, you'd wanna run through this for each individual sample. And for each sample, you need to adjust the, for the read groups, the sample name to be whatever that file was, or the organ and species and sample. However, the library platform and unit can all be the same information. That doesn't need to change, but the specific sample name needs to be unique and needs to be different for each of our samples. Otherwise you run into an error down the, down the road. So it looks like that uh, our sample that was submitted is submitted and not running. So it looks like we may be uh, a little bit of a log jam here with of getting things to run. And I know we're almost uh, we're running close to out of time as well. And so I just want to kind of cover a few remaining things <clears throat> in the tutorial. So we just finished the read groups. Next thing we need to do is index our read group BAM file. So again, this is using SAM tools, index the BAM. Our input is just, we just need to specify the input and that's it. And let that run. Then we are ready for haplotype caller. And so we can run through that with GATK haplotype caller. We do need to specify a lot of different pieces, which you just that we have already. We have our reference file. We have our index file being the .fai. We have our dictionary file, which we made. Our input file is this, um, is our sorted uh, read group file that was, that we just sorted. We have the read groups as indexed. And we also have our indexed, uh, uh, BAM file, so BAI, which we'll create in this next step. <clears throat> Here we're doing just uh, a GVCF. However, uh, for haplotype caller, if you wanted to have everything specified, invariant sites as well as variant sites, you would change the study in haplotype caller. Uh, I have to look to see if the app as currently set up allows that. However, 
if you were to do this on the command line, um, <clears throat> that is a very uh, straightforward process to change. In some cases, again, that invariant size are necessary. Uh, other times, uh, I mean, it, it does make the files a bit bigger um, and it may not be necessary for all things, but it's worth at least considering. Once haplotype caller has ran, usually we would do haplotype caller for each of our individual files or each individual samples. Then we would combine the GVCF files together, uh, all of them to one. So we have a variance across all samples. And then at the very end, we would actually do the genotyping, the joint genotyping to get our final uh, uh, VCF file um, that we can use for downstream analyses. At that point, you are done with SNP calling. Now you can go into SNP filtering. Uh, on the GitHub, there is the BCF tools command that you could do on your own. There is currently not a good app in Cybers for this. There's so many options that you might want to explore and change, um, but it runs very fast on local machines. And then once you have that VCF file, there are a few steps here in Koji, which I will not go over right now because we're about out of time. However, you can upload that VC, that your VCF file uh, because we have the, the genome that we use for this already in Koji. And go through the steps here. And at the end, you would be able to, let me scroll down here to the bottom. You can sort and find different SNPs. So A to a C, A to a T, any insertions or deletions. You can search through those the different chromosomes, contexts, figure out where the differences are, a way to uh, visualize those. And there's plenty of other options uh, in Koji as well. Um, if you are so inclined to look at those, um, I will leave you to have uh, time for that. But again, all the data, uh, you can either use the final GATK VCF file that you create, or there's the uh, VCF file uploaded in the community data in the VCF folder that you can download to your computer or select that in Koji and look at it that way. So we got about 10 minutes left. I know there's a lot. We didn't get through everything. Our uh, regroups just finished, but I want to uh, open the floor these last 10 minutes or so. Um, if there's any additional questions that you may have, uh, either specific projects or uh, kind of more in general things we've covered, I'll try to address that. Um, if at any time, during the tutorial or your own data set or your own data exploration. <clears throat> if you have questions, I have um, my email on the first slide of the uh, presentation. Feel free to reach out if you have questions about certain things. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for participating today. I hope it's been helpful. I know there's a lot here, um, probably plenty to work through on your own. Uh, but definitely good luck on your SNP journey, um, especially moving to the downstream analyses. There's some resources already available. So uh, thank you all. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to take those if I can or address those if I can. You're very welcome. I hope this has been helpful. I know there's there's plenty of details that I was not able to cover. There's some great questions in the chat as well um, with some additional kind of more downstream things, more kind of more complicated things. Um, but hopefully this is a very good start to get people moving in the right direction. <laughs>